Chen 院士您好，非常感谢您接受。Hello, Professor Chen. Thank you very much for accepting this interview with CGTN. We know that you've been dedicated to researching the topic of how and why humans settled on the Qinghai Tibet Plateau. In this regard, you and your team have achieved a series of significant results and discoveries. For example, the discovery of the Denisovan jawbone fossil on the plateau is a breakthrough that has hugely impacted the international archaeological community. This discovery has pushed back the history of human activity on the Qinghai Tibet Plateau from the previously estimated 40,000 years ago to an astonishing 160,000 years ago. Extending it by 120,000 years, could you please share with us the significance of such a major discovery in exploring the migration and evolution of humans on the Asian continent? We know that human evolution has gone through several crucial stages, from early hominins and upright hominins to what we call early Homo sapiens in our country, and then to modern Homo sapiens or modern humans. The Qinghai Tibet Plateau, as we know, is an extremely unique environment with an average altitude exceeding 4,000 meters. This high altitude results in both severe cold and oxygen deficiency, and oxygen is vital for human beings. The plateau's distinct conditions, characterized by harshness, hypoxia, high altitude, and intense ultraviolet radiation, make it an environment where human survival is extremely challenging. Despite these challenges, humans have inhabited almost all islands and areas on Earth, except Antarctica, and have even been present in the Arctic. The Qinghai Tibet Plateau is no exception. We now know that the plateau is home to Tibetan and Sherpa populations. How humans reached this region, why they did so, and how they adapted to the environment afterwards are globally significant topics that everyone is interested in. Our research focuses on the discovered jawbone fossil. Firstly, morphologically, it is not from a modern human. Measurements of its jawbone dimensions indicate that it does not belong to an upright hominin, but rather it is most likely from an archaic Homo sapiens. However, this cannot be conclusively affirmed as the fossil is relatively small. We have attempted to explore new methods, such as testing ancient proteins, which suggest a population related to the Denisovans or a branch thereof. Within the Denisovan population, there is a unique gene called EPOS1. Initially unknown, this gene was later found to be highly prevalent in more than high-altitude Tibetans, including the Sherpa people, indicating its role in adapting to oxygen deficiency. Our study of the fossil aims to answer two main questions. First, identifying the species to understand how they acquired the EPAS1 gene for adaptation to the unique environment of the Qinghai Tibet Plateau. And second, determining the time period during which this population existed. Unfortunately, due to the risk of damaging the fossil, we did not directly test its age using teeth. Instead, we analyzed the crystallized calcium carbonate found on the jawbone surface. This calcium carbonate quickly sealed after the individual's death, providing an age close to the time of death, with an average age of around 160,000 years. Although humans have lived on the Qinghai Tibet Plateau for such a long time, which factor, the benefits or drawbacks, has a greater impact on the local ecological environment? Do you have any recommendations for the overall health and sustainable development of the Qinghai Tibet Plateau? Originally, humans came from nature and developed in harmony with it. Gradually, we evolved into a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, staying in one place when resources were abundant and moving to another when they were scarce, essentially adapting to nature. As we enter the agricultural phase, we began to record and calculate, and human impact on the environment increased. In the industrial era, the impact expanded from regional to global, significantly affecting the environment. Beyond the profound impact on the Qinghai Tibet Plateau, our primary concern in early assessments were understanding how human societies influenced the natural environment. 
We assess the historical human activities and evaluate the contemporary impact of industries, agriculture, mining, transportation, tourism, and other factors on the environment. Simultaneously, the government has undertaken numerous environmental protection initiatives, such as forest and grassland conservation. We also need to evaluate the positive impacts of these ecological projects. Generally speaking, from our country's perspective, although human activities on the Qinghai-Tibet plateau have an impact, the overall impact is relatively small. The impact of human activities on the Qinghai-Tibet plateau is approximately one-third of the national average for human activities. It remains one of the areas with the least human impact globally. However, it is crucial to recognize that human activities are continually increasing, and in some regions, the impact remains substantial. Certain engineering measures have resulted in significant environmental effects. Therefore, the purpose of our assessment is to understand the extent of the impact of human activity on the ecological environment and to purpose recommendations. Our recommendations include legislation for the ecological protection of the Qinghai-Tibet Plateau, serving as a model for global ecological conservation. You've emphasized multiple times the importance of China's western regions, as well as the arid areas in Central Asia and the Middle East, as crucial pathways for material and cultural exchanges among humans. Additionally, you've led a national research and development program focused on the impact of climate change in the arid regions of Central Asia and its connection to the historical changes along the Silk Road civilizations. This project involves a cross-disciplinary study that spans geography and archaeology. Could you share your thoughts and impressions on leading such a project? From the perspective of the entire Eurasian continent, there are essentially two distinct Asias. One is the region influenced by the monsoon, including areas such as Beijing, our eastern regions, and a portion of the Qinghai-Tibet Plateau. In this region, summers are characterized by high precipitation, while winters are cold, reflecting the impact of the monsoonal circulation. Summers are hot and rainy, while winters are dry and windy. However, in the more western part, the influence of the monsoon is minimal. A significant portion, including the Hexi Corridor to the west of our country, extending to Xinjiang and Central Asia, is not affected by the monsoon. Moisture in this area primarily comes from the Mediterranean, Atlantic and Arctic oceans. So, in essence, there are two regions, one under the influence of the westerly circulation and the other under the influence of the monsoonal circulation. When we talk about the Silk Road today, it was established over 2,000 years ago during the Han Dynasty. However, even before that, there was a transcontinental exchange of food across Eurasia, and it could be considered a form of globalization. This exchange, which predates the Silk Road, had significant societal impact. Furthermore, this exchange is closely tied to climate patterns, as we can observe the influence of goods originating from Africa spreading across the entire Eurasia continent. The patterns of this transmission are intricately connected with the climate dynamics. After exchanges between the civilizations began, Chinese civilization influenced Western civilization and the civilizations in the Tigris-Euphrates region, and they, in turn, influenced our civilization. What are the significant impacts of this exchange? In fact, the Silk Road had several impacts. First, it facilitated human trade exchanging goods between different regions. It served as a trade route, a pathway for commerce where individuals could exchange their goods. I have something good, and you can buy it from me. You have something valuable, and I can purchase it from you. The Silk Road was a route of trade and commerce. Secondly, it played a crucial role in the dissemination of technology. For example, agricultural techniques and domestication of cattle and sheep from that region spread to our country, and our technologies also reached them. Additionally, there was cultural exchange. Societal systems from one region and societal systems from another impacted each other, absorbing the positive aspects of each.
Another fact is the movement of people. In Central Asia and other areas, there were many people who resembled the Chinese. In essence, our populations were also in communication. In fact, northern China has always been a convergence of various ethnic groups. Society is continually a process of mutual exchange and interaction. Communication has the power to break barriers and overcome obstacles. In fact, communication is an advanced and essential mode of human development. We should not abandon this mode of development. Though the world may be more complex now, and we face various challenges in communication, you established an organization in 2019 called the Association for Trans-Eurasia Exchange and Silk Road Civilization Development. What was the original intention and purpose behind initiating this international alliance? We know that historically, the Silk Road brought tremendous prosperity to humanity, fostering the development of the entire Western Hemisphere, including Central Asia, West Asia, and Europe. The extensive trade at that time propelled the societal development of the entire Eurasian continent. This process had already been established before. I believe there is a need to establish a platform that facilitates mutual communication. Such a platform would enable cross-continental exchanges in culture, trade, technology and populations, ultimately promoting societal development. Understanding human societies from a historical perspective helps us better comprehend contemporary initiatives such as the Belt and Road Initiative and the concept of a community with a shared future for mankind. Therefore, the purpose of studying the past is to inform the present. Investigating past climate changes and their impact on the Silk Road holds significant practical importance for optimizing the utilization of the Belt and Road Initiative and mitigating the environmental impact of human activities in the future. We've discussed the history from 160,000 years ago to the present and come to the conclusion that human communication, interaction and cooperation are undoubtedly essential elements that we must uphold as a means of advancing forward. This insight is very enlightening. Thank you.